Right. So uh, if you just tune in online uh, and you don't know or you don't know who I am, I'm Hans Holmberg, and I've spent uh, the last few years hacking on zone file systems, but in user space mainly. Uh, I, I worked on uh, a user space file system for RocksDB uh, for uh, database workloads called ZenFS. But the last year or so, I've been uh, I've joined this project, that's on XFS, and I'm really happy to be able to bring over some of the research and, and hacking I've done on CNFS into, into this project, um, doing a little bit of a small part of this. And there we go. So this is nothing that came like out of thin air. Um, Sonic XFS is something we've actually been talking about for a long, long, long time. Um, but it really just kicked off uh, last year. 23. For 23, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I know this is a week of off-by one, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and the current state of this is that it's experimental, uh, but it actually works um, across a number of different uh, types of sort of zone layouts. So it supports SMR, uh, CNS SSDs. Uh, I've been, we've been running tests on both, and uh, they can handle work, large workloads. Um, it should also work fine, work fine on some mobile flash, but I've only managed to emulate that and just try it out to see, sign and check if, to, to see that it, uh, it should work there as well. Uh, Currently, it passes 99% of applicable XFS tests. We all know that the last percent is the hardest, right? Uh, so we're working through uh, the last bits there. But, but we're not too far away from actually having um, all the applicable tests passing. Uh, the code is not upstream yet. It's not even RFC. But you can uh, access the code if you go down and download this presentation and, and go to InfraDead and, and check out the right branches and build this. Uh, so you can play around with it in an emulator on a, or on hardware if you want. And this is a thing that has not been like a, a, a single man effort. Uh, uh, we first and foremost depend a lot on Derek J. Wong's uh, work um, modernizing the XFS real-time feature. So we sort of add on top of all of that good work. Um, and on top of that, uh, Christoph has done most of uh, the actual work for Zone XFS. Um, and Damon has been helping out doing testing and tuning for SMR, make sure that uh, things work out in that scenario. Uh, Shinshiro has also helped out with testing. Uh, myself, I've uh, mainly worked with uh, the data placement parts, um, on space accounting, making sure that uh, the sort of logical space we expose can actually be backed uh, by uh, the, the zones we have on, on, on the devices we have running zones on. And I spent a lot of time uh, debugging and fixing up stuff uh, around the garbage collection. So I'll focus on those parts. Uh, I'm not an expert on whole of XFS. I only worked for it one year, and it's a very old file system. But uh, I'll try to cover um, stuff in general and um, those things I've been working on in particular. So to like try to grasp on. To, to understand how this works, uh, we have to first look at what, how XFS stores data and metadata. And uh, data is stored in XFS in allocation groups. Um, and these are virtual regions of fixed size. Uh, and each action allocation group manages its own set of uh, files and manages its own backing storage. So by splitting it up, you sort of divide and conquer the storage space you have, and you can it provide uh, scalability and parallelism and avoid uh, choking points. Uh, um. So that's great. And it sort of looks like zones, doesn't it? So th that, that, that looks like it shouldn't be too hard to add zones to that, um, to, to store those things in zones. Uh, metadata, on the other hand, is a much harder problem because uh, in XFS, that's stored in two B plus trees. And B plus trees are not a good fit for zone storage. Uh, they require in-place updates, so you can't do that on uh, uh, sequential write required zones. Um, 
it's, yeah, it's uh, incompatible with the append-only writes we, we want to do. So um, what do we do? Well, uh, the XSFS real-time feature comes to the rescue. Uh, and we can utilize that to separate data from metadata into different devices. So the XFS real-time feature is uh, a feature that's been there for a long, long, long time in XFS. Uh, and it allows you to specify one device for metadata and one for real-time sensitive data. So that's what we built for originally. Uh, you can specify a separate device that's going to only take the stuff you really care uh, really about the latency and, uh, um, for the accesses on, 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 on those spe for the specific files. So by building upon this, we can keep the B plus trees and focus on uh, storing data on some storage for now. Uh, and if you mount the uh, file system with the RT inherit one option, you place all uh, data from all files on, onto the uh, real-time device. And we're going to enable real-time, or we are, have enabled real-time uh, device data onto zone storage. Uh, and it looks something like this. Um, so we end up with this layout. We depend on block, conventional block storage for metadata, uh, and it c comes up with the limitation that we can run out of space on the metadata block device before the data device and vice versa. But this is a common problem. This is just uh, good to be aware of. Uh, and although we need two separate block devices, doesn't mean that we can't have it on the same piece of hardware. Uh, we can have uh, a, 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 SSD with two different namespaces, one conventional namespace for metadata, one zoned namespace for uh, the, the data. Or we can use conventional uh, zones on SMR drive for the metadata, uh, as long as we split it up via DM linear, for example. So once we have this split, we can map the real-time allocation groups, uh, storing data to zones one-to-one. -one. So it's a really nice fit. And we uh, utilize copy and write to Im avoid in-place updates for data, so we can always uh, store things append-only. Uh, we implement a new data allocator um, that treats zones as buckets, and we fill them up with zone appends. So that sort of provides us with the structure we need to be able to store things. But uh, uh, we have some opportunities in, in, uh, with zone storage. We can actually manage data placement. And how should we design this allocator is a um, research question I've been looking into a lot. So zone storage allows the host to make active choices uh, for data placement on the media. This is sort of the selling point for zone storage. Uh, you, you can get uh, also higher capacity by um, overlapping uh, tracks in the SMR case and, and forcing sequential write patterns. Uh, but you also can uh, have better performance and, and better endurance uh, if you place data in, in a good way. Uh, so. How should we do this? Um, how can we like, have a generic algorithm for doing this? Um, that is um, something that we've been playing with, and we come up with a pretty generic algorithm um, that uh, sort of aims to make sure that once a file is deleted and that file is big enough to cover a zone, uh, that zone can be reused without any other reclaim. So we can minimize garbage collection. So what we do by default is uh, data placement by file. So a lot of uh, modern workloads generate pretty big files, which are in the order of magnitude of, of zones. So we try to separate files into different zones. And uh, if we can fill them up to a reasonable degree, uh, we can uh, get by without moving stuff around too much when reclaiming. So what we do is that we keep up n, max n zones open for writes. And this number can be configured by the user or depend on uh, hardware limits of the device. So it can, de depends on um, the, the device capabilities, but you can, we can have a handful or, or many open zones at the same time. And what we want to do is to separate data 
from different files into different zones as far as possible. And once we reach the open limit, uh, we're gonna just pick the least recently used zone if an uh, yeah, empty zone can't be assigned. So I made a little bit of stop motion to illustrate this. So if you first write uh, file A, uh, that's gonna end up in, in one zone and probably the user is not gonna match like the zone capacity com perfectly. Uh, but in, in this case, this is a modern workload, it, it, it can do a long, uh, big file write. Uh, it will fill almost a zone in, in a good case. And if we write file B, uh, that might not be as big, but it's going to end up a different zone, so at least we've separated the data from file A. And we write file C, uh, we, it ends up in a third zone, but now we're at the limit. And once we have to write a new file, we are forced to fill up one of the zones with, uh, that, that is currently open. It means that we're gonna fill up a small section of the, uh, the first zone and write the rest to a new one, and so on, so forth. But we end up in this, in the end, if this is a short example, that uh, we have a pretty good method for uh, keeping file data separate and if we want to reclaim uh, the first zone, for example, we just have to, and if file A is deleted, we just have to uh, uh, evacuate a small amount of data. And so that's the default, and that works quite well. And then the workloads, uh, the applications just have to write reasonably large files. And uh, the file size, like the optimal data placement file size is actually exposed by XFS, you can read that. So I'm, I'm planning to add that support to RocksDB, for example, saying that you should probably write files this big and things will be better for you. Um, so that's, that's something I'm, I'm planning to do uh, in the coming months or so. And um, talking about RocksDB, uh, RocksDB has uh, an, an internal uh, view and uh, it can sort of foresee the, fe fe the future for its files. It, it stores uh, its key values in an SS, a sort of string table um, hierarchy and it, it knows that some files will be living longer than others and it actually provides write hints uh, to the file system via an F control. This is what we, what we have today to provide hints to file systems and, and, and blocks. Uh, block devices. So we uh, utilize uh, the hint that uh, RocksDB gives us if it, this data is, or this file is hot or not. And we collocate file data if there's a good match between the expected lifetime of this data stored in an open zone with the incoming file data. So we sort of tag the open zone with a current um, uh, data temperature and we try to match that in a good way. And if there's not a good match, we just try to separate data, uh, just like we did for in the default allocation scheme. And the current uh, algorithm or the current matching sort of function uh, that's illustrated here to the right um, is based upon uh, statistical uh, analysis of, of RocksDB SSD, SSD tables. So that's just one use case. So we need to do a little bit more research to see if this is algorithm or this heuristic is good for, for more use cases. But the basic idea is try to separate files as far as possible, and if we have to co-locate, we, we try to combine um, data from different files with uh, matching temperatures. And one of the responsibilities that comes with active data placement is they also have to do the garbage collection. So to reclaim un, uh, unused written space, uh, we need to do reclaim. Um, so we have a really simple setup uh, at the moment, nothing, nothing fancy at all, uh, standard stuff. Um, we, we, we do this lazily, so we don't do any proactive gar garbage collection. We just start and kick off data, uh, reclaim uh, when we can't keep enough zones open to do this data separation in a good way. Uh, we just pick the lowest hanging fruit all the time for zones. We don't try to do any smart estimates. 
that's, that works uh, most of the time. Dennis did his thesis on this, and uh, that's, that's a good default method. We haven't done anything fancier than that. Um, and the only like trick we have uh, is that we allocate move data separately from user rights. So uh, if we have garbage collected data, we will put that in a zone that's not going to mix with new data coming in, which sort of leads to a nice uh, hot cold separation. Um, so it's just a, a standard good trick to use in this type of uh, algorithms. But uh, another headache that comes with the data placements and garbage collection is that we have to make sure that um, garbage collection keeps up with user rights. So if you have a really heavy um, right user workload, we have to make sure we reclaim data uh, at least in the same rate as uh, data comes in from the user. And that means that we have to slow down user rights to match the reclaim rate. And to make these things worse is that the minimum reclaim unit in a zone. Once we have filled up a zone, we have to evacuate all the data out of it before we can reset it. And uh, if fragmentation is high, we actually may have to evacuate several zones before we can have one zone to give back to the user. Uh, so if in a, we might have to yeah, uh, clean out stuff out of several zones uh, to uh, yeah, allow a user right. And we can't really block during that time because that can take seconds and we'll have enormous um, write latency hits. Um, so what we come up with is uh, uh, a scheme to rate limit user rights uh, and uh, try to estimate how fast we, we do this uh, by looking at the current level of fragmentation. So we, we don't have to um, block uh, for several seconds uh, when do we reclaim. So it's nice to say we throttle, but how actually actually do you throttle? This is, this ah, is in the next slide. Ah, cool. Okay, <laughs> yes. so press the next slide then. <laughs> yeah, so this is a tricky problem. Um, so what we do when we're running low on zones, um, we uh, awake the, the, the garbage collection demon and make user rights reserve free space before we allocate. So a user comes in, a write comes in, and uh, wants to allocate uh, space to writes and three blocks. And then we're gonna, if if we don't have that space available, we the user is gonna reserve it. So it's like just making a reservation at the uh, just to to be able to to write later. So if the reservation cannot be covered by existing free space, the, the write is actually put to sleep until enough free space has been reclaimed uh, to cover a number of blocks for the incoming write. So it's just going to wait in a queue. Um, and the free space is produced in the garbage collection daemon in, in small chunks. And that is the key to uh, avoiding big latencies uh, hits. Uh, we sort of continuously update an atomic counter freeing up user writes uh, waking them up as we clean out a zone. So we don't wait for a full zone reclaim to, to wake up uh, a bunch of users. And we can do this, and can do this um, um, by estimating how long it will take to evacu evacuate the current zone by taking the uh, fragmentation into account. So it's sort of complicated, but if Please go back and, and look at the slide, or and maybe me if you have any questions on the actual implementation. It would be good to get more eyes on this. But the basic uh, idea here is to uh, updating a sort of reclaim space counter in small increments and waking up the users uh, who had made the reservations uh, in, in according, uh, in, sort of matching that speed. But if you do so, don't you increase fragmentation? Don't you increase fragmentation? Uh, how? Well, the user writes, and the assumption is that it's writing a single, a large chunk, yeah. which 
from the user's perspective is pretty much sequential because it is a large chunk of data. Yeah, yeah. You just don't. You just happen to have not enough space to write this data. Yes. If you free up small bits and only write down small bits and then wait again until another bit is freed up. Oh, yeah, yeah. But then, then right clearly, yes, it, this small piece is. But then this user might be the only one which, which is throttled, or the other users will be throttled too. So yeah, but they, they're, this, done in, they're done in order, so uh, we're not like round robbing. We reserve the rights in the order that they come in. So if ah, if so they, oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. So you uh, you serve one user first, and then the next one. Yeah, if it, like if it wants to write, someone right. wants to write. Uh, 256k. Uh, okay. Then the, and another user thread you, is gonna write uh, 16k. We're gonna serve the one first. So if you experimented with um, partial writes, a partial what? Partial writes because that would be the alternative way out. You could just have returned e inter. I oh, sorry, mate. I couldn't do it. I only wrote four bytes of your 20. Right yeah, <laughs> but um, if the pressure is high, you have nothing. Like you, you can just. Yeah. Well, so yeah, we have to wait somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, so we we have a, 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 a like a specialized wait queue for this. A lot of fun hacking in this area. Uh, rarely you have to put uh, the user to sleep yourself. Um, yep. So we is this thing working? Uh, looks like sort of complicated, right? But it actually, we've been beating on this for, uh, I don't know, six months now, and it's fairly stable. You break it from time to time, but it, the, the, it seems like the, the method is uh, robust enough. So I think we have time to try to, um, to show this demo. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, you can actually see the text. Um, uh, this is a demo showing um, a, a sort of newly invented interface we've added to an obscure feature called Mountstats. I don't know, maybe it's, yeah, it's also obscure for me uh, anyway, where we can provide sort of introspection into how the uh, how zone XFS is allocating and what's the sort of internal state of open and, and garbage collection zones is. Um, so you can see what's happening via this interface. And the test here is to uh, use a virtual non-block uh, device with 64 zones, uh, with six, max 16 open zones, um, 15 data zones, one dedicated to GC writes, and first fill up the, the drive with uh, files of random size, up to 95% capacity, and then do uh, a sort of mixed write and delete workload for those files, forcing garbage collection. So you're gonna basically fill it up with a lot of random file sizes and then deleting and, and writing new files, uh, basically really, really fragmenting and stressing the, the, the garbage collection uh, to be able to write new files. Um, this has now been upstreamed uh, in a generic XFS test, so you can run this also on, on all kinds of uh, 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 file systems. Uh, and I'll see if I can. Share my video. Yes. So now it should start. Yeah, it's just a delay. So first, you can see uh, open, the open zones being filled up uh, in uh, least recently used order. And once we have uh, reached the five capacity now, uh, the garbage collection kicks in. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have a flag here that states if we need reservations or not, if the user is forced to wait for a small period of time before they can, we can serve their, their rights. And this has been super useful in, in debugging all of this. Um, 
And I think that makes the whole sort of allocation um, scheme and uh, sort of inner workings quite visible to the user. If you have any questions, I think we can cover them uh, in the end, but let's see if I can stop this and also show some benchmarks we've been running. So uh, one of the Standard things that people do uh, when they benchmark uh, data placement is to run RocksDB and see if we see any benefit. So that's what we've started off doing here. So these are some really early data placement benchmarks to see if we're on the right path. Uh, we should be able to do, uh, provide significant advantages uh, for this uh, use case. And we use um, recent RocksDB uh, with direct I.O. Uh, we first fill up uh, the file system to 80% um, using fill unique random. Uh, that's a workload that's generated by uh, the test tool dbbench. And then we do overwrites and uh, uh, read while writing workloads. And we compare this sort of apple to apples with uh, a conventional drive using vanilla XFS. Um, this is not the bleeding edge, but it's a fairly recent um, iteration of our, of our code. And what we can see here is that uh, data placement by file, if you compare the XFS zone with the XFS, XFS conventional cases here, uh, only just separating different files into different zones provides almost double the throughput in these cases. So we reduce the uh, write amplification by a factor of two without actually modif modifying the uh, application. And if we add hints, support on top of that, we get another 10% on top of that. Uh, and once we have that, we can actually surpass uh, or be on par with uh, the performance we got on with ZenFS, which was specifically built. Like, it's a, that was a file system specifically engineered for, for RocksDB. So there is a way to do generic uh, data placement. We just have to make sure it covers more uh, and, and provides advantages for more workloads than uh, just RocksDB, of course. But it's a good start. So um, I'm happy, uh, maybe in the future, be able to retire ZenFS and just use XFS instead. So what comes next? Um, well, we have to upstream this. Um, we have to make sure that the outstanding XFS real-time dependencies are resolved first. Um, Derek and, and Christoph is hard at work with this. Um, and then we need to uh, get the stuff we've, we've added to uh, XFS, about 3,000 lines of code, um, some changes to MKFS and XFS tests. So we're getting there, so uh, look out for the RFC if you're interested. Uh, it should be coming. Um, I'm not saying when, but <laughs> not. Not too far away, I hope. Uh, and in parallel to that, I'm planning to do more benchmarking. And yeah, we should start thinking about also uh, how to do log structured metadata so we can put also metadata on, uh, on some storage. Um, so there's some exciting work ahead for that. Yep, that was what I had. Uh, first of all, I don't agree that B3, B3 is not good for log structured file system because I'm using namely B3 in my file system. It's log structured, pure log structured. It okay, so you figured out a good way to, <laughs> but okay, yeah. Yeah, it not sounds. But not in XFS, I think. <clears throat> yeah, we have to re do too much to XFS to. Yes. Yeah. And uh, next point that you simply converting XFS in F to FS. Pardon? Converting XFS into F to FS. Because you have in place area and copy and write. No, no. no. <laughs> okay, so, and I'm trying to uh, follow 
about garbage collector problem. So, uh, do you reserve some zone for garbage collector collection? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So why going out of the open zone, uh, available zones? I mean you will need to reuse you have to yeah we we do have a small area <coughs> reserved for garbage collection but those zones are going to fill up too okay but if you you have something like several zones opened already and you can fill data there yeah but we don't want to mix uh, incoming with outgoing zones like we don't want to mix uh, data coming in from the user with garbage collected data yeah, but we have already open zone for garbage collection. Yeah, but then eventually we will have uh, a lot of zones with a lot of stale data unless we, we slow down the user rights. But metadata lives in conventional zone. You can update metadata at any time. Yeah, metadata, yes, but you need a place to put data. And if you can't keep up with the user rights, you have to slow them down. Yeah. You simply cannot assume that you always will have conventional zones, that's one. And the other one really is that you can only wipe zones in a go. So basically, either you wipe the entire zone or nothing is ever erased. So it is a really bad, bad idea to stuff in new with old data which you might need to clear up. So you really want to have one zone where you always write new data, but you should guarantee it or have a reasonably good chance that you won't need to clear it up immediately afterwards and then look for the older zones to clear them up and free up space there. So um, while you're technically correct, yes, this mechanism would require more open zones to be had because we always will have an open zone, at least an open zone where we write to and possibly at least one other open zone for cleaning up. Yes, we will increase the open zones count. That is a drawback, but really otherwise you, it, otherwise it's really hard to make a reliable garbage collection because you will need, might come into a situation where you need to clean up that very zone where you are writing to, which makes reliable garbage collection nearly impossible. Let's switch to SSDFS. Yes. <laughs> you can contrast your implementation to this. <laughs> I'm always comparing XFS and SSDFS. 